overcoming the accuser. I'm still on the theme I started in the last couple of times about how to get through what's just ahead. Because there are interesting, challenging, and very disturbing times ahead. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this word today, we're asking that you would really speak into our hearts, equip us with what we need for what's ahead, and motivate and empower and give us the grace to be overcomers and to triumph in Christ in what's ahead in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to look at the mentions of being overcomers in the book of Revelation. Then he writes to Smyrna and he says this, Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. See, this is the persecuted church. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison. There's no doubt who Jesus blames for this. The devil. The devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested. What's the test? To see if you are prepared to fight and to overcome or do you succumb? And you will have tribulation 10 days, not 10 weeks, not 10 months, not 10 years, 10 days. Amen. Be faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. We have to stay true to Jesus no matter what pressure is put on us. They got pressure on us to recant or to turn back from our faith in Jesus and we must not. And then he said, you can get a crown of life. He who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says of the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. That's what I was talking about before. If you do the hard yards now, you won't have to face the second death. Amen. No pain, no gain. If you succumb now and curtail to the devil and bow down to him, cower to him, like he says when he tempted Jesus' worship, Kiss me just this once, you know, worship me just this once like a dog licking its master's hand. You have bowed down to him if you do that. You might not be persecuted, but will you escape the second death? That's the issue. You've got to overcome to not be hurt by the second death. Then Jesus wrote to the third church. This is Pergamos and they were compromising. Revelation chapter two, he said, I've got a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. In the church, there are going to be those who are constantly coming up with ways to prove from the Bible that fornication's okay. They're going to say, well, really that only applies to those that are married. If you're not married, it doesn't count. They're going to say things like that, but that's not what God says. God says we've got to avoid that and we've got to overcome every temptation in that area. Amen. In the old days, it was to eat things sacrificed to idols. And what we learned last week, an idol for us is anything we allow to take God's place in our heart. Anything we look to for identity, provision, for health, for wealth, for rescue, for safety. Anything we look to for justification is an idol. And we have to make sure that God has first place in our life in all of these areas. Amen. Verse 16, Jesus says, Repent of this, or else I'll come quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He fights against those that are listening to deceivers, he fights with the sword of his mouth. He brings the word of God to correct and sort it out. And if people do not listen, they're going to come under very strict judgment, according to what I'm reading here. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now listen to it. To him who overcomes, overcomes a temptation for putting other things in your heart, adhering to the world, committing sexual immorality. Amen putting a stumbling block before others, causing them to fall. That's a very serious sin. And if we don't overcome the temptation to do that, we won't get this reward. To him who overcomes, I'll give some of the hidden manna to eat. I'll give him a white stone and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Amen. 
Then Jesus wrote to Thyatira, which the New King James calls the corrupt church. Revelation 2, 20, then 26 to 28. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. Same kind of thing exactly. And he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him I'll give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like a potter's vessel, as I have also received from my father, and I will give him the morning star. We mightn't fully be able to explain what all of these things are, but we know that they are rewards from God and they come to those who overcome, overcome the enemy, overcome temptation, overcome this so-called prophetess, Jezebel. So you've actually got to overcome the Jezebel spirit. Deal with it. Drive it out. Have nothing to do with it. Do not listen to it. Overcome it in the name of Jesus, even if you have to do 40 days of prayer and fasting like Elijah did. You can overcome Jezebel. Drive it out of your church. Drive it out of your family. Drive it out of affecting you and tempting you and those around you. Be an overcomer and then you can have authority to rule with Jesus over the nations and get the morning star. Amen. Then Jesus wrote to Sardis, which the New King James calls the dead church. Revelation 3, 1 to 2, then verse 5. I know your works. You have a name that you're alive. Amen. Reputation. A reputation of being alive in God, but that doesn't make you alive in God. Amen. Reputation is what people think you are. Character is what God knows you are. He said you have a reputation that you're alive, but you are dead. Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect before God. He who overcomes shall be clothed in a white garment, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life. And I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What do you got to overcome? The dying off of things in your life. You've got to overcome that. You've got to keep that fresh life flowing in every area. Be an overcomer of gangrene setting into parts of your spiritual life. Amen. This is important. Then he wrote to Philadelphia, which the New King James calls the faithful church. Revelation 3, 11 to 12. Behold, I'm coming quickly. Now, this is the faithful church. He said, I found that you've got a little strength. I remember God saying that to me one day. He said, you've got a little strength. And I was almost insulted till I found out that's the best commendation God gave out in these seven letters. A little strength was the top mark. Amen. Now we can all improve. Listen to what he says here. Hold fast what you have. See, you've got a little strength. Don't lose that little strength. Hold on to it. Help it to grow that no one may take your crown. So there's a crown for those who maintain the strength and grow it. Amen. Verse 12, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, New Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and I will write on him my new name. We have to stick with it Grow that strength and do not lose our spiritual strength. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. You can nourish your spirit man, keep him strong on the word of God and then exercise your spirit man in prayer in confession, in praise and in warfare. Keep at it. Do not back off. It's not a time to retire and to sit back on what you've done, but to keep pressing in, keep believing and keep growing in God, be an overcomer. And finally, Jesus spoke through the apostle John, it was to the Laodicean church. The new King James calls this one, the lukewarm church. I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold. I could wish that you were hot or cold. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now that sounds a bit 
off-putting. But you've got to think about what's in the mouth of Jesus because remember he talks about standing at the door. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I come in and we eat together. We're eating together. But if you turn out to only be lukewarm, he spits it out. He doesn't want to eat with you and you don't get the benefit of the living word that comes from his mouth. So you've got to stay hot. Remember the love of many will wax cold. We've got to stay burning hot in our love. We've got to stay hot in the word of God. Keep that word coming in. Keep it alive. Keep saying it. Keep praising God. Amen. We've got to watch complacency in Jesus' mighty name. Verse 17, because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Now we could unpack all of that, but it's not for this message. The point is these people had stopped reaching, they'd stopped believing because they had some financial security and they didn't realize that the blessing of God wasn't to make them cool off, but it was to give them a platform from which to get hotter and more on fire for God. Amen. With some confidence and some victories under their belt. Verse 18. I counsel you to buy from me gold. It always speaks of refined faith. Refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed. Now that's the garments of righteousness because we are righteous by faith. It's the only way to be justified before God is the justification of faith. So we keep living by faith, reaching out, new faith projects. Come on, believe for something new. Believe for a gift for your spouse, for something to happen in church, for the salvation of souls. Believe for supernaturally good things. Believe for freedom in our nation. Believe for overthrow of evil rulers. Believe for the move of God in revival power, for churches to be strengthened. Believe God in the things that bother you at home, the things that are needed in your family, things that can make your life more fun. You can use your faith in them all. Amen. Jesus said he's like a servant. Your faith can serve you in the field and he can serve you at home. God wants you to be an overcomer in all these areas. Keep reaching Keep believing. Keep your faith running hot. Do not become lukewarm and cool off. Amen. He said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I'll come into him and dine with him and hear with me. Now, this hearing his voice and opening the door sometime comes back to this. We've got to repent of pride and all kinds of other forms of arrogance and I've arrived and I know what I'm doing and I've got this sorted out. All of that has to be repented of and we have constantly to say, please forgive me, stand in the blood of the new covenant, take the communion emblems and say, Jesus, I depend on you. I need you. You hear him knocking. I've got some truth for you, Dave. And then you say, yes, come in. Speak into my heart about what I need to hear. It's often encouragement. It's a word of prophecy, but there may be something confronting in there too, something from which we need to repent. But if we hear his voice and open the door, he comes in and dines with us and he with me. Amen. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne. Amen. That's the one who overcomes being lukewarm or cooling down. As I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. So seven times in the seven letters to the seven churches or the seven church ages or the seven stages of church life, each time he ends the same way. He who overcomes will get some kind of reward, not him who just lies down and deals with it and copes with it, but the one who rises up in the word of God and overcomes it. They're the ones who get rewarded. Now we're going to jump halfway through Revelation back to the verse we started on. Revelation 12, 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Maybe this is an accumulation of all of those seven things we just read. 
All of those seven things were overcome by this group here. They overcame him in all facets, in all areas, in all temptations, in all tests, in all temptations to yield, to fail, and in all the tempting to go and trust the world in every area of attack. They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb, through the covenant and forgiveness, by the word of their testimony, standing in the living word of God, and they didn't love their lives unto death. They wouldn't surrender to the enemy, even if he threatened to kill them. They would never give up their faith in Jesus. Amen. And the final statement for the reward of overcomers comes in Revelation chapter 21, verses 1 to 8. Listen to this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there were no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. You know, the Bible talks in the book of Ephesians about us being a temple for the Holy Spirit. God has always wanted to dwell with us. And again in Corinthians, he says, I'll be their God, they'll be my people, I will walk among them. Here he says it, the tabernacle, the dwelling place, or the tent of God is with men. He will dwell with them. They shall be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. Listen now to the list of things that go with this. So this is a great reward, having God with us, dwelling with us, eternally. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. See, God says the old heaven and earth is going to pass away and he's going to make a new one. Amen. Then he who sat on the throne said, behold, I make all things new. He said to me, right, for these words are true and faithful. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. You've got to want this. You've got to thirst for this. You've got to be prepared to stand up and fight the fight of faith. He who overcomes will inherit all these things. See, it's the overcomers who get to have God dwelling with them. No more tear, no more pain, no more crying, no more sorrow, no more devil hassling them. Then it says in Revelation 21, verse 8, but the cowardly, now the word cowardly is the fearful. It's talking about those who recant under persecution, those who back off. Back off believing the word of God. Back off their confession they're a Christian or back off any confession in Christ. The going gets tough, they give up. That is the cowardly. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the, well, the unbelieving, same kind of thing. Unbelieving, the abominable, that's those who have made themselves a stench in the nostril of God by going the devil's way, the world's way. Murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Who wants to be saved from the second death? I know I do. And he says you have to be an overcomer. You have to stick with Jesus and follow him. Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many are going that way, but narrow is the gate. And constricted is the way that leads to life and there are very few who find it. That is the narrow doorway or the narrow pass and the constricted path. Few find that. What is the narrow way or the narrow door or gateway? It's like the narrows, you know, the Straits of Magellan, you know, that's, it's like the narrows in the sea where they've got to go through and avoid the rocks. And then the path is constricted. It doesn't say narrow is the gate and straight in the English version of straight is the path. It says straight is the gate and narrow is the way. Straight as in the Straits of Magellan. Amen. It's a tight way to get in. In context, in Matthew 6, 
I don't have the time to expand this today, but if you read it, he's talking about doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's the narrow way onto the path. Then staying on that path is hard because the constricted way is like the old, old, old historic running the gauntlet. And they ran the gauntlet when one soldier was getting punished and he had to run down between two rows of soldiers with clubs of woods and they would punch him and hit him as he ran past running the gauntlet, not the mechanical gauntlet. That's what it's like following Jesus. You've got assailants on both sides of this path trying to knock you off the path, trying to make you compromise love. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. This is something we have to persevere with and that we need fresh manna from heaven, fresh word, and we need to brandish that word like a sword to get on this path and stay on it. Now, I know Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And if you get hold of his word and you brandish that, you'll find that makes your way easy. Amen. But if you don't get on his word and you don't follow Jesus, you compromise your stand, you allow the world, the flesh and the devil to dominate your heart, it won't be as easy as it should be because Jesus said, my yoke is easy. And his yoke is when we do it his way and when we walk with him in step with what he wants and stay on that constricted path. Amen. Then he makes it easy because we can get a hold of his sword and his sword is invincible. It's overcoming, all powerful. And that's why the Bible says this. Thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ. That's 2 Corinthians 2.14 and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. Amen. The joy of the Lord is your strength. He will always lead you in triumph if you go his way. Take on his yoke, take up his sword and his full armor, and wield that sword like a weapon. Quench the fiery darts with the shield of faith. Amen. Make sure you've got the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the belt of truth and all around you. Amen. And make sure that you're ready. You're willing. You're broken before God. Got no pride. Living in humility and worshipful surrender. Staying in the secret place then you'll find his yoke is easy and his burden is light and you'll be in joy when the world around you is in turmoil. Amen. You'll be in victory when everybody's sinking. You'll be like Noah. He was afloat when everybody else was sinking. It's conditional on all of the things we're mentioned in these last couple of weeks. Keep your eyes on Jesus. But to even do that, you have to be born again. And today I want to encourage you, if you're haven't been born again yet, this is your opportunity right now. You can get your name into that Lamb's Book of Life. You can start following Jesus and enjoy the privileges of being born again, being an overcomer, triumphing in Christ, being at the marriage supper of the Lamb, having no more tears at the end, if you do it Jesus' way now. Amen. It might not be easy to turn away from your old life at this moment, but once you get started, Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. And if you'll pray the prayer I'm about to lead you in, acknowledging that Jesus died for your sins, he was dead and buried, but that he rose again, having paid for your sins, which he couldn't rise unless he had done, that he's now at the right hand of the majesty on high, he's opened the way to heaven. And if you give your life over to him, put off your old life, put on the new life he gives, follow him all of your life, you will be where he is. Simply say this prayer after me. Say this, say, Jesus, you say that, Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I turn from my old life. I acknowledge that you died to pay for all the things I've done wrong. I acknowledge that you rose again from the dead. And I believe that you rose victorious over my sin. Today, Lord Jesus, I receive you as my saviour. I receive your new birth. I put on that new nature. And from this day forward, I follow you as my Lord and as my good shepherd. 
I thank you that I'm born again. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. And as I continue to follow, I am assured of my place in heaven. And I'm asking in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, amen. If you said that prayer today, I believe you're born again. I encourage you to tell someone, start following Jesus, read the Word of God. If you haven't got a Bible, you can easily download a Bible app from the App Store or for the one that works for your phone. And you can get the Bible in many different translations. you find one that really speaks to you. And you can also get the audio Bible so that you can have it on and listen to it even when you're going to sleep at night, when you wake up in the morning, when you're working around a house or driving in your car, you can listen to the Word of God and keep your eyes on Jesus. And remember, you can pray in Jesus' name. And he said, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Now, if you've got no one to tell about this, please write to me and I will know who you are and I'll be able to respond. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Now, before we go, I want to pray for every one of us. And Father, I pray that you would enable us to get through what's just ahead by being overcomers in Jesus' name. And I pray again for the truth of this message to really sink down in our hearts. We are not those that draw back to perdition, but those who press on to the saving of the soul in Jesus' name. God bless you. Thanks for listening. Bye.